All right, so yeah, we've been, um, of course I wasn't here last week, but uh, for the previous five weeks or so, been uh, looking at guidance, finding and knowing the will of God, and we've talked about various things, um, looking at this through the lens of making decisions and how uh, the scriptures would guide us to make decisions in life. We talked about how we want to make restful decisions. We want to be anxious. The scriptures make it very clear that we're not to be anxious in our decision making, but we want to be restful. Well, how do we go about obtaining that restfulness as we make decisions? And there's, we talked about a variety of things. We talked about how um, God is ultimately sovereign and in control of all things. And so because of God's sovereignty, we can rest as we make decisions because we know that God's got this. I can't mess up God's grand plan for the universe because God is sovereign. And if I can mess that up, We've got some serious problems in our theology here, right? Like we we got to actually understand what the Bible teaches about God and His sovereignty. That being said, though we recognize God's sovereignty, we also found that we are still responsible for our actions, and God has called us uh, to be making decisions in, uh, in a wise way, and we saw how the scriptures direct us to be pursuing wisdom as we make decisions. We talked about the terminology of the will of God and how we can uh, use uh, that terminology in ways that uh, the Bible does not use that terminology, so God doesn't have this secret, detailed plan for our lives, and our job is to try to figure it out. The Bible doesn't talk about God's will that way, but rather, the Bible talks about His will in two ways. The first way was God's providential will, His sovereign will. Nothing can thwart that will. The other way the Bible talks about God's will, it has to do with areas of morality and righteousness and ethics. So, um, when when the Bible says, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that's from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it's very clear what God's will for our lives is. It's righteousness, it's holiness, it's following the clear commands of Scripture. But then we begin to ask other questions, okay, well, what about if this decision that I have to make, if, 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 if this, this course of action I'm considering, if there isn't a moral weight to either of the options? How do we go through making decisions when one doesn't seem to be morally right or wrong? And that's where we've been talking and focusing on this concept of wisdom. We want to be pursuing wisdom. And so the Lord has given us tools to find wisdom and to, and to uh, gain wisdom for life. And that's what we've been talking about the last uh, three lessons. Uh, using the tools, uh, we talked about God has given us His Word that grants us wisdom. But we don't want to use it wrongly, Right? Uh, we don't want to do random passage flipping. Uh, we don't want to take passages out of context. No, we want to be reading God's Word in the context that it was intended to be understood. Uh, and, so, and we don't want to confuse uh, descriptive passages with prescriptive passages. Like when we get into narrative passages, the narrative passage is telling us history, what happened. That doesn't mean that our life is to reflect that perfectly. There are lessons and application that we can learn from those passages, uh, but we want to be careful that we don't d confuse the descriptive and the prescriptive passages. So we avoid these errors by never reading a Bible verse. A Bible verse is that key word. We want to be reading verses. We want to be reading verses in their context. Read the whole paragraph. Read the whole chapter. You know, we want, a verse has its, uh, has its meaning based in its context. We cannot take it outside of that. So we avoid uh, using, these, um, using God's word the wrong way by uh, reading verses in their context. The context is the key to understanding the meaning of any passage. Anytime we have a, a confused about any particular verse, I, I told a story about how uh, I had someone text me uh, asking me if I had an interpretation on a particular verse. And I looked it up, and I just read that verse in isolation, and it's just like, whoa, wait a second there. That seems to contradict what I understand of other things, what the Bible teaches. That, that ver How do I understand this verse? But then I just read that paragraph, and within the paragraph, it just made perfect sense. Okay, no, Paul was making, or yeah, we actually don't know who the author was. He was from the book of Hebrews, so I can't say it was Paul. Might have been, might not have been. Uh, but the author of Hebrews was trying to make a point, and if you just took that one verse in isolation, we could have seriously uh, misunderstood what the author was actually trying to communicate. But in the context of the whole paragraph, the, the meaning was actually crystal clear. Uh, so we want to be observing God's Word in its context. 
the right way to use God's word, again, observe and obey the specific commands of Scripture, apply the biblical principles of Scripture. We want to be comparing our goals and motives to those of the Scripture. And I'm I'm just kind of going through this very quickly because this is all review, Um, but uh, Hebrews 4.12 talks about how the Word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. It's able to discern between the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So God's Word can expose to us the goals and the motives that our own heart has within ourselves. And so as we read God's Word and as we study God's Word, we want to be comparing the goals and the motives of Scripture with that of our own and seeing if it lines up and try to bring ourselves in line with the goals and motives uh, to that of Scripture because that reflects the goals and motives of the Lord. So we want to be uh, observing that. And we want to be absorbing God's Word daily. We want to be studying it on a regular basis uh, because if we do not do that, we are going to be limited in the amount of wisdom that we can actually gain through God's Word. The more time we spend in God's Word, the more we're going to be able to make connections and see things uh, that we would have missed otherwise. So that's God's Word. Um, there's the tool of prayer. Uh, we don't want to ask for something that is forbidden. Uh, we don't think it's right to ask for a sign, uh, but rather um, God has given us right ways to pray, and we find examples in scriptures of what that looks like. We want to pray for wisdom, James 1.5. Uh, he who lacks wisdom, ask, let him ask of God, and he will give to him wisdom. Uh, so that is something we want to do. We want to uh, take the Lord up on that promise. Uh, We want to ask the Lord to reveal sin in our hearts because it is the sinfulness of our own heart that corrupts our ability to make decisions in a fully wise manner. So we want to be weighing that out and uh, asking the Lord to reveal uh, that sin within us. And we want to ask the Lord to sanctify our desires. Scriptures say whenever we sin, it's because we're led astray by our own desires. And so we want to pray, Lord, I want my desires to be in keeping with your word, so give me uh, your desires, sanctify my desires. So that was the tool of prayer. Uh, we saw the tool of counsel. We don't want to be uh, make, uh, doing selective counsel seeking, right? Asking people that uh, we know will only agree with us as we try to make a decision. No, we want to ask a variety of people uh, that might be able to give us input from different directions. We don't want to put too much faith in just one counselor, right? That, that one counselor, as wise as they might be, they might be blind to one particular area. So we don't want to be limiting ourselves uh, to just one counselor, but rather uh, seek a variety of counselors. We don't want to blame the decision that we make on our counselor. Oh, you know, I, I thought this through, and I, I talked it through with, with Pastor Larry, and so therefore I've decided to, you know, okay, it's good that you talk things through with a pastor, but at the end of the day, it's your decision to make. You want to own that decision and move forward. Uh, good or bad, you have to make the decision at the end of the day. Uh, right ways to use counsel. We do want to seek advice. We want to seek good counselors, people who are godly and wise, people who know the scriptures well, they know you well, they know your situation well. Um, any one counselor may not fit all of these descriptions, but you definitely want to be talking to people that hit uh, multiples of these, uh, and you know wherever they lack, you know, Talk to somebody else who fits in that category. Uh, And then we want to know our advisors first. The more we get to know the people we might be seeking for counsel, the more they can speak into our lives because they know us better. We want to be completely honest through the process. Um, If we withhold information, we're going to be limited on the amount of wisdom that we can gain. And we talk things out. Sometimes just talking things through will help make it clear what the wisest course of action should be. Last time we talked about circumstances. And we talked about how uh, we can be reading circumstances uh, rightly and wrongly. And uh, this is where I think uh, it's, it's this tool of circumstances and then the, the tool uh, number five that we're going to see, our feelings, uh, that I think get misunderstood the most as we begin to approach the process of trying to make decisions. Um, so we want to be very careful that we understand these things uh, in, in a biblical way. Uh, we don't want to read too much into coincidences or what might we think are good or bad circumstances. Right? We don't want to be reading these things like they're some, some kind of omens for how we're to make decisions in life. Right? I told the story about how uh, this one individual was praying about whether or not that she should go on a missions trip. And when she got done praying, she opened her eyes and uh, her digital clock said 747. So she concluded, Boeing 747, I should get on the plane and go on this missions trip. 
reading too much into that you know, what, what seems to be just a coincidence. Uh, that, that's not the way God would have us uh, to be making decisions. He doesn't call us to try to read into these different things that happen in our lives this way uh, and, and just say, oh, you know, because I saw this shape of this cloud, therefore I ought to do X, Y, or Z. Or, oh, you know, there, there was a car accident on the road that I'm supposed to travel on next week. Maybe I shouldn't actually go on the, the trip I'm planning on going on. No, we're not to be reading uh, these circumstances like omens for whether or not we should be making that decision. Uh, I don't think that just because there's an open door, that necessarily means it's the right option. We have a responsibility to consider what is wise. Just because some, a door remains open doesn't mean it's necessarily the right option. There could be, there could just be, it could be, uh, you know, a different, uh, well... We want to be seeking wisdom. We want to know what wisdom is. Just because something is a possible option doesn't mean it's the right option. Um, and we don't want to assume that bad circumstances mean that we missed God's will. Oh, I made this decision. It's going poorly for me. Oh, I can't believe I missed God's will for my life. Well, no, as we've talked about in previous weeks, there are all kinds of circumstances that are bad that we find in Scripture but these individuals that were experiencing these bad circumstances were perfectly within God's will. Now, do the bad circumstances mean you could have made a bad decision? Well, yeah, it's possible, and you're just reaping the consequences of that decision. But we can't assume that just because there's bad circumstances mean that you've missed God's will. Because we know that we cannot be outside of God's sovereign will. It is impossible to be outside of God's sovereign will. So just because the circumstances are bad, that doesn't mean you're outside of God's will means that God's will for your season, this, for you in this season of life is to go through these bad circumstances. Uh, so we want to understand that in a biblical way, understanding uh, God's sovereignty in the midst of that. So if those are wrong ways, what are some right ways to read these circumstances? Uh, the circumstances that we have in our life are the good acts of a sovereign God. Uh, God, again, is sovereign. He's in control over all things. Sometimes in God's sovereignty, in His providence, He essentially makes a decision for us. I've known many missionaries that planned and, and devoted their lives to becoming missionaries overseas only to develop uh, chronic health issues that could not be properly cared for in those situations overseas. And the only way that they could receive the medical attention that they needed was to be in the United States. God had effectively closed the door on that mission field for them. It was no longer wise for them to remain in that, on that foreign mission field because of their health issues. So those are, that was the good acts of a sovereign God. Even though it seems like a bad circumstance where they had this negative health issue, no, it's still the good acts of a sovereign God, God directing us and essentially making that decision for us. Uh, and so sometimes that happens, and when we do come across those scenarios, we want to recognize that, like, no, okay, no, this doesn't mean I've missed God's will. No, all of this is still within God's sovereign plan. It's the good acts of a sovereign God. Sometimes our circumstances inform some things about ourselves. If we get fired from a job, that may tell us about, maybe we're, maybe we're a lousy worker. Or maybe we just don't have a particular skill set for that job. But when, when circumstances happen, some things like that, sometimes we can just uh, can, uh, be helpful for us to take a step back, to reevaluate where we're at and what we're doing, and we can learn some things about ourselves uh, based on some of the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Uh, so sometimes it can be helpful to view things that way. <clears throat> okay, all of that was review. <laughs> I feel like I talked very fast through all of that. Maybe I should have slowed down. I don't know, but I want to get through uh, the rest of this uh, material here this morning. So I've saved the most challenging one for last. The fifth tool that God has given us for to gain wisdom, to try to understand uh, how we make decisions, our feelings. This is um, very challenging to understand and how to do, you know, how do we understand our feelings? What are we to do with our feelings? <clears throat> how, do we, how do we interpret these in a right way? 
uh, and are really, uh, and I think all of us have probably experienced people interpreting their feelings in not so good ways, right? Making decisions that were foolish because they just felt like they either want, that's what they wanted to do or, or that's what they needed to do. Uh, I'm sure many of us have experienced uh, seeing that gone awry in many people's lives. Uh, so we want to be approaching this with eyes wide open and, and seeing, okay, you know, how are we actually to approach this and understand this? Um, some of the things as we look into this, it might be, uh, this might be challenging for us as we try to think through this. Okay, you know, have, have I used uh, my feelings in ways that should, they should not be used in the past? And so um, I want to encourage us to be... Uh, uh, to keep an open mind through this, um, compare everything I say to God's Word and Scripture. Definitely want to be doing that, uh, but we want to be understanding this rightly. So again, we're going to look at wrong ways and right ways to use our feelings. Uh, wrong ways to use our feelings. We don't want to assume that just because we have an inner prompting or a feeling within ourselves or st- a feeling in our spirit or however what kind of terminology we might want to say, we don't want to assume that just because that's there, it is necessarily from the Holy Spirit. That is, that is not a good assumption to make. Um, numerous illustrations that could be given of, of people uh, doing this exact thing. I uh, see Christians getting into trouble all the time. They feel like they, they sense God leading them to do something And they believe that this impression that they have, this subjective feeling that they have, is God's clear, rock-solid direction for their lives. I've heard so many people say, well, God told me to do this, or the Holy Spirit said to me X, Y, and Z. But they're not talking about like an audible voice, right? Most of the time, there are a few people that I've run into that say they've heard an audible voice, Uh, but... Uh, this, this one person that I've worked with uh, extensively, he used to tell me all the time about things that God was saying to him. And he wasn't talking about an audible voice. He was just something within himself that he was interpreting that to being God's voice. And so we want to think through this. Okay, is this actually right? And so people aren't talking about an audible voice when they uh, talk about this, but rather usually uh, it's some kind of feeling uh, that they had or they They might say, I sensed in my spirit that God wants X, Y, and Z from me. And so we want to be thinking through this. Uh, Here's an example of this going poorly. Um, At uh, Calvary Bible College, where I went to school, um, there were uh, uh, college students were hired by the dean's department to assist in overseeing and uh, overseeing the dorms. Uh, so they would be hired uh, to be a part of that process. There was a, um, a limited number of positions available. The job came with uh, particular benefits uh, that, that was helpful in schooling. It paid for part of school and uh, gave you certain responsibilities and authority and things like that. And so it was a very highly sought after position. Well, there was one person individual that uh, went around telling other students that they knew that they were going to get hired for this position because God told her to apply. And so because God had told her to apply and God had told her that she was going to get this position, she was confident that she was going to get that because, well, yeah, God told me. Well, they go through the whole interview and the hiring process, and guess what? She didn't get hired. So what happened? God had told her to apply. God had told her she was going to get the job. What happened? She was not able uh, to discern that this prompting that she had within herself was not from the Holy Spirit. It was not from God, but rather it was just her within herself. And this happens all the time. All the time. I see this happening so many times. And I think um, as, as we get into the right way to use our feelings... I think I know why she felt the way she did. And I think I can explain that and interpret that uh, in a way that actually lines up uh, with with how the Bible says uh, we are to be guided in life. But that that prompting was not from uh, the Holy Spirit. Um, Part of the problem with this is that so many times uh, people get these feelings or these promptings, and so they begin to interpret Oh, okay, I have this feeling, 
So this is how God must operate. But the problem is the Bible doesn't talk about God operating in that way. The Bible doesn't talk about God using uh, these inner promptings, these, these feelings that we have to guide us. That's not how the Bible talks about how God guides us. So what we find happening is people are interpreting their they're interpreting scripture, they're interpreting God acting through their feelings instead of interpreting their feelings through scripture. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to interpret our feelings. We want to interpret our feelings through the lens of scripture rather than the other way around. This is so important uh, to keeping ourselves on track as we try to uh, understand things. Um, and I know that this is tricky. Uh, I know this is difficult because um, invariably, when people say, oh, I know God told me this, they're pretty confident, right? Like, I, I've, I can't tell you how many conversations I had with, with other students that, oh, I know, I know that was God's voice. Well, how do you know? No, I just know. But how do you actually know? And there's no way to actually say, oh, I know this. And if they were to be uh, fully honest with themselves, there's no way that they can know for certain that it was, in fact, the voice of God. And another, I, 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 there's so many illustrations that I could give you, but another one, um, uh, one of my uh, coworkers once told me about this uh, thing that he had heard from the Lord and uh, that he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt it was from God. He just knew it. He was certain of it. He knew that he knew that he knew. But when I probed further into whatever it was that he was feeling, and I probed into that, some of the implications of that feeling directly contradicts what Scripture teaches. But he knew that he knew that he knew that it was from God. But it contradicts Scripture. God isn't going to give us some kind of feeling inside of ourselves that directly contradicts His Word. That's not the way the Holy Spirit is going to operate. He's not going to contradict Himself. All right, The Spirit inspired the Scriptures. The Spirit is not going to give you a feeling that directly contradicts Himself. It's just not going to happen. And so if we are to press in on this, we, there's no way that we can say 100% beyond a shadow of a doubt that I know that this is from God because so many people have said that and it has been proven false so many times. And yet for some reason that doesn't stop people from continuing to use this kind of terminology even though even when it is exposed. And I, I challenged this guy directly on this, uh, this particular issue. I was like, man, you just told me X that this was from God but it directly contradicts Scripture. What do you, how do you understand that? Well, well, I'm not sure. Maybe it's not from God? Well, okay, maybe not. But it's the same kind of feeling he has when he's at other things. You know, how, how do we know that we know? Well, the answer is, unfortunately, uh, that we can't. Um, yeah, so we don't uh, want to be assuming this. Just because we're having this inner prompting within ourselves, it's from the Holy Spirit. We want to be very careful uh, with making those claims. Um, I, I mentioned it already, just going to reiterate, I, you know, this shouldn't be something that has to be said, but it, it, it is. The Holy Spirit, again, is not going to directly contradict His Word. He's not going to give us a feeling um, that violates His Word. You know, oh, I just feel like God wanted me to leave my spouse and go with this other person. No, <laughs> that's preposterous. God isn't going to lead you uh, to sin. That's not the way it works. Um, so we want to be very careful with that. Um, as we approach this, though, I'm not dismissing these feelings. I think there's a right way to understand these feelings. I'm not dismissing them. But we, we want to be careful that we're not making this mistake. Second wrong way to use feelings we can let ourselves be held back from making a decision because we have this lack of peace. A lack of peace can hold us back in ways that I don't think it should. Just because uh, we have a lack of peace about a decision, I don't think that means it's necessarily the wrong choice. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3 says, 
and this is Paul talking as he t- speaks to the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3, Paul says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. It seems as though Paul did not have a sense of peace about being in Corinth. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. But does that mean that he shouldn't have been in Corinth? No, that's not what that means. God used him mightily in Corinth. So we can't look at this lack of peace and that, that this is not a reliable way to discern God's will for us is this, this uh, peace. I told the story in our very first class, way at the very beginning of this course, I told the story about how when we first moved here, uh, we moved here without a car, we needed to buy a car. And uh, uh, we found a vehicle, we talked with, a, with the owner, and it seemed like a good car. I agreed to buy the car. We made arrangements to meet up the next day to actually make the transaction. Well, that night, I had a very distinct lack of peace about that decision. Uh, I just, I felt like I'd overlooked something, or, or I just, maybe this just wasn't, Maybe this just wasn't the car God wanted me to have. But I just, I, I, was, I was very torn up inside about it. And I actually hardly slept that night. I was very anxious about that commitment that I had made to buy that car. Very distinct lack of peace. Fortunately, God gave me an awesome wife who talked sense to me. Said, no, we're just going to buy the car. Okay, we bought the car. And the car was a fantastic car. It was a great vehicle. Uh, drove it for four years. Uh, never had a major problem out of it. And I just sold it actually just a couple of weeks ago because we just simply didn't have a use for the vehicle anymore. But it was a great car. It was a terrific vehicle. It was an awesome decision that we had made. But I was that close to backing out because of the lack of peace that I had felt that was actually misleading. It was a false alarm lack of peace. So how do we understand a lack of peace? How do we understand that rightly? I would say that a lack of peace is less of an indication about the quality of a decision and it's more of an indication about our trust in God. If we have a lack of peace about a certain situation, you know, are we actually trusting God through that decision? Are we actually trusting God that even if we make what seems to be the wrong decision that God can work in and through that. Now, are there some times when uh, that lack in, in okay, I'm going to, uh, on the next slide, we're going to talk about our feelings in, in a way, uh, talking about intuition, where we can just, kind of, there seems like something's off in a certain particular scenario, and, uh, and we can understand that rightly, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, but most of the time, in fact, many, many times, uh, the lack of peace is less of a barometer, again, about the quality of the decision and more of a barometer of our trust in God through that decision. Uh, so we want to be uh, understanding that. Feelings can be good and useful. As, and we're going to talk about that uh, in, a, in a positive way in a moment. But they are not reliable indicators of God's will. We simply cannot know beyond a shadow of a doubt if, the, if a feeling that we have, if there's some impression that we have is actually God's voice or not. We cannot know that. It's subjective by its very nature. We cannot know that. But that doesn't mean we dismiss our feelings altogether. We want to understand them rightly and understand them and how they fit into uh, how God does actually guide us as we make decisions. Um, so as we, uh, that's, those are wrong ways to use our feelings. Let's talk about some right ways. Right ways to understand our feelings. Sometimes, our intuition is right. So, uh, this, I, 
God has made us in incredible ways. God has made our brains in incredible ways. Our brains are constantly absorbing information, observing the world around us in ways that we are not even consciously aware of. And uh, science bears this out about how uh, incredible our brains are constantly working through and assembling information in different ways and connecting dots in ways that we we're not even aware of so many times, and sometimes we can be in situations where we have our intuition that just seems like, oh man, I, I don't know why, I can't explain why, but it seems like this is the right way to go, or it seems like I should not continue down that road. How do we understand that? I think that is a result of how God has wired our brains in incredible ways. It's assembling information. It's connecting dots. And it is, it is feeding us information in the form of feelings. I just, I just feel like I shouldn't do this. Or I feel like I should do that. That's our intuition. Sometimes our intuition is right. Where if we were to make a decision based on that intuition, we might, that might turn out to be correct. Sometimes our intuition is wrong. So how do we evaluate that? Well, I think part of that is through experience. The more we go through different uh, life situations, the more we're going to understand about how good our intuition actually is or isn't. Some people's intuition is, is phenomenal. Other people's intuition is eh, not so great. And so the more we work through things in life, the more uh, we begin to have experience with our intuition, uh, the more we're going to be able to understand, okay, how trustworthy is my intuition actually? In theory, the older we get, the better our intuition should be because we have more life experiences and our brain is assembling more information, connecting dots in more ways uh, that might guide us uh, to be making uh, good decisions. Uh, but it's not always the case. So, even though we recognize that sometimes our intuition can be correct, we want to be subjecting it, again, to God's Word, we want to be cross-checking it with other individuals. You know, just talk to somebody. Say, hey, you know what? I just I have a gut feeling about this, and I think it's this. I, don't, I can't really articulate why, but this is, this is what I, I'm thinking and feeling here. What do you think about that? And begin to talk through that. That process can help clarify if that intuition is, is spot on or if it's maybe, uh, maybe leading you astray a little bit. Uh, so we, we can recognize our intuition and we can understand that, okay, our, I have a gut feeling about this, but we cross-check it. We don't trust it implicitly. We cross-check it uh, with the other tools that God has given us. We don't want to just assume, again, we don't want to use the terminology of, oh, yeah, I have this gut feeling, therefore I know it's from God. Well, I have an intuitive feeling. I want to cross-check that with God's Word. I want to cross-check that with, uh, with other people that are more godly and wise than I am. I want to constantly cross-check that. But probably the most helpful ways that our feelings actually guide us is that our feelings tell us what we want. And I think this was the case with this... Uh, this, this um, classmate that I had that you know, just felt like God wanted her to apply and, 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 and get this, this position. I think she just really, really wanted that position. And she was misinterpreting that strong desire with God telling her to apply and get this, uh, get this position. I think that's what was going on in that scenario. She really wanted it, so she had convinced herself that God told her to apply. Um, but I think this is actually is the, one of the most helpful ways that our feelings do help us. They tell us what, uh, what we want. As a gauge of what's going on inside, of what our heart might desire, what we value, what we fear, these, our feelings can be invaluable to understanding that. Um, and, and honestly, there are many times when a decision that we have to make is simply going to come down to what do you want more? If you've got two job offers that are, you know, maybe they're, they're pretty equal in the pros and cons in many ways, which job do you want to do? You, you know, which one do you want? And you're free to go ahead and pick that and choose it. Uh, so uh, our feelings can be very helpful communicating to us what it is that we actually want. Now, I want to clarify, I am not saying follow your heart, <laughs> 
right? Just because you feel like you want something, that doesn't mean that that's what you should do. You know, we can want things that are wrong, right? We have that sin nature within us that, that, that desires things that are not good. But as a barometer of telling us what it is that we do desire, our feelings can be very, very helpful for, with that. But we still have the responsibility to compare what we want with the goals and motives of Scripture. So we want to be very careful with that. Uh, but this, these, this uh, is very helpful for us uh, in understanding our feelings that way. And third, we want to use appropriate language to describe our feelings. Please never say, unless you're talking about reading it directly from Scripture, please never say, God told me to, the Spirit told me, fill in the blank. Unless God is communicating directly to you, and in the, way that the, Bi- the way the Bible describes God's communication it's not through these subjective feelings that we have. The Bible doesn't describe God's communication that way. And in these days, God has spoken to us through His Word. That is how He has said He has spoken. His Word is the complete final authority. So as we talk about these, our feelings, we want to use appropriate language and not confusing this language, saying, oh, I, God told me this, God told me that. Okay, if you read it directly out of God's Word, okay. Yes, God did tell you that. In fact, God tells everyone that. You know, that's, that is something that we are uh, to be doing. But if it's not that, if you're talking about our feelings, uh, that is not the kind of terminology we should be using. Um, again, our hunches can be correct. They can be incorrect. So we want to make sure uh, as we talk about our feelings, we're using appropriate language. Yes, I, I'm, I'm feeling this. It's okay to say that. It's okay to recognize your feelings. We just want to keep them in a proper place in understanding uh, how they fit into uh, God's Word. So to sum up uh, this section, um, I would say that it's healthy to be skeptical of our feelings because of the sin nature we have within us. We want to be skeptical of our feelings. Just because we have an inner prompting doesn't mean it's from the Holy Spirit. It could just be uh, something within ourselves. Uh, No matter how confident that you are that it is from God, you cannot know 100%. You you cannot. It's a subjective feeling. You cannot know 100%. So we want to be very careful with that. Uh, Just because we have a lack of inner peace doesn't mean it's the wrong decision. So we want to be aware of that, and we want to use proper language when talking about our feelings. And then at the end of the day, sometimes when there's no moral difference between multiple options, feelings tell you what you want, choose that option, and that's okay. You can choose what you want in those scenarios. So those are the five tools. Um, And just to wrap up this whole series... The five tools, God's word, counsel, uh, prayer, circumstances, feelings. We don't use them to discern God's will. We don't use them to try to figure out God's will. God isn't tricksy. He isn't playing a game with us, subjecting us to this endless guessing game. But rather, we use these tools to seek wisdom. The Bible does command us to seek wisdom. The Bible doesn't tell us to try to figure out what God is doing. He doesn't try to tell us to figure out the future. He does tell us to seek wisdom. So we use these tools for the sake of gaining wisdom. Gaining wisdom is a lifelong pursuit. I'm going to read Proverbs 2, verses 1 through 6, and then verse 9. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, listening closely to wisdom and directing your heart to understanding. Furthermore, if you call out to insight and lift your voice to understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it like hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from His mouth come knowledge and understanding. Then you will understand righteousness justice, and integrity, every good path. So we are to be pursuing wisdom, a lifelong pursuit. 
That is <clears throat> how God would command us to be making decisions. So how do we make restful decisions? Bottom line, to sum up the whole course in one sentence, pursue wisdom and trust God. God's got this. You can't mess it up. So we pursue wisdom to make wise, good decisions. I'm going to close with an illustration that uh, I heard from someone else. Um, Life is like an amusement park. There's many rides within the amusement park. There are some rides that are outside of the amusement park. God has given us His clear commands in His Word. And as long as we are inside the amusement park and riding rides only inside the amusement park, we are within God's will of command, His clear teachings from Scripture. If we go outside the amusement park, That's when we're violating Scripture. We are outside of God's will of command. It's outside the park. But within the park, there are many rides to choose from. One ride might be taking this job. Another ride might be taking that job over there. This ride might be marrying person A. this This ride over there might be marrying person B. Lots of different rides to choose from. Are, all, are we going to enjoy all rides equally? Probably not. Different people enjoy different rides differently. Are all rides going to be as smooth as other rides? Probably not. So we want to exercise wisdom as we choose which rides to get on, but we have freedom from God to be making that choice and choosing which ride to get on. We cannot be outside of God's will unless we're getting on rides outside the amusement park. In that case, we're in clear sin, violating the clear commands of God's word. But as long as we're inside the park, we are free to choose whatever ride we would. We want to use wisdom to make that choice. but Then we trust God through the rest of it. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we're grateful uh, for your word, grateful uh, for uh, how your word uh, teaches us and guides us, gives us wisdom for life. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the freedom that you have uh, given us in life and that uh, we cannot thwart your purposes no matter, uh, no matter what we might do. We are always within your sovereignty and your, um, your, your uh, providential will oversees all things. We praise you for that truth. Thank you that you are sovereign and uh, that you are uh, that uh, great and powerful. uh, And and we worship you and praise you for that. Lord, you've given us personal responsibility as well in the midst of that. And um, we have a responsibility to pursue wisdom. So I pray that you would help us in that. Uh, as As we have these different tools at our disposal, I pray that we would use them rightly, that we would not let ourselves get swept away by uh, using uh, the various tools that we might have in, in, uh, uh, in ways that you have not intended those tools to be used, but rather that we would use them in accordance with your word, use them rightly, uh, understanding, our, uh, understanding your word rightly, uh, going to you in prayer, uh, seeking counsel from others, uh, understanding our circumstances rightly as the good acts of a sovereign God, and then understanding our feelings rightly, so always uh, keeping them subject to you, your word, and cross-checking our feelings uh, with what others uh, who are more wise than we are, what they might uh, be seeing in a situation as well. Help us through all of this, Lord. Give us your wisdom for this day. Give us your wisdom for every day, for life. May we honor and glorify you through it all. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.